me okay? Yeah. Nods. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Um, okay. Great. Okay. Well, I will go ahead and uh, just dive in if that's all right with all of you. So thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us today. I'm really delighted to welcome you to the third annual Photography Ethics Symposium. My name is Savannah Dodd, and I'm the founder and director of the Photography Ethics Center. So the Photography Ethics Center is a social enterprise organization dedicated to promoting ethical literacy across the photography industry. We do this by offering a really wide range of educational opportunities in photography ethics, including workshops, online courses, multimedia content, and events like this one today. Um, this year, we have been very uh, pleased to be working together with Red Eye, the Photography Network, to organize and deliver this event. So Rebecca is here from Red Eye. So I was thinking I'll hand it over to you now, Rebecca, if you want to say a couple of words. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Red Eye is a nonprofit organization based in Manchester. We run events and support the photographic community um, nationally and internationally. Um, so thank you. Yeah, and I'm Rebecca, the program and events coordinator. That's great. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, we've been really grateful to have Red Eye as a partner for this symposium. So thanks so much for all the help in getting us getting us here today. The aim of these symposia events is to promote conversation and critical thought about ethics and photography. And the aim this year is documenting and exhibiting vulnerability. So we're going to be discussing um, the ethical implications of documenting vulnerability in others, of photographing our own vulnerabilities, of exhibiting such photographs with care. So we will explore how, how, how can we exhibit um, vulnerability in ourselves as well. So when we make mistakes and our ethics are questioned, that can feel like a very personal and uncomfortable sort of personal affront. So I'm wondering, you know, what happens if instead of responding with defensiveness, what happens if we respond from a place of openness to being wrong and to learning something new? So how could such moments inspire our own development as photographers and foster productive conversations about photography ethics and promote positive change across the industry? In my interview with Crystal Ding on the Photo Ethics podcast, Crystal said, for some reason, we view being wrong or being shown up to be wrong as a really negative thing. But actually being wrong about something just means that there's something you didn't know. And that's really exciting. So my hope for us today is that we can all approach these sessions with the same kind of excitement and openness. We're very lucky to have three fantastic speakers join us today. We have Rafaela Rosella, Justin Carey, and Sophie Harris-Taylor. Now I'm going to introduce each of them before they speak, but first I'd like to just run through uh, the schedule of events today so you know what to expect. So our event today is going to start with each panelist giving a 20 minute introduction to their work as it relates really to the theme of vulnerability as well. Then our panelists are gonna have a conversation about vulnerability in their practice. And that's gonna be prompted by questions from me and from all of you. So please, at any point during the session, please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A feature or the chat function. For the speakers presentations and the round table discussion, we're gonna ask you if you could please keep your microphone muted and you're welcome to have your video on or off as you please, um, but please just take note that the session is being recorded. After the round table, we're going to have a five minute comfort break. So please take this opportunity to grab a glass of water or a cup of tea so that you can come back refreshed for the participatory discussion on vulnerability. So this is gonna be an open space session that's gonna be led by Rebecca from Red Eye. So she'll introduce that session um, to us a little bit later. The open space session will not be recorded. So that'll you know be a, just an open space for, for all of you to, to have a discussion on these themes. The open space session will end at 2.45 p.m. GMT, marking the end of the formal program for today's symposium. However, I know that many of you have also signed up for project ethics reviews, and these are going to take place between 3 p.m. and 5 p.m. GMT. 
So if you've signed up for a review, you should have been allocated a time slot. But if you have any questions at all about this, you can message Rebecca either via email or direct message in the Zoom chat here. Right, I think that's all. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Rafaela Rosella. Um, so Rafaela, if you wanna start pulling up your slides and I will introduce you. So Rafaela Rosie Rosella is an Australian artist of Italian immigrant and Anglo-Celtic convict settler descent who rides and resides in Mianjin or Brisbane. Ra Rafaela's practice draws from her lived experience of being raised in an over-policed, low socioeconomic community in New South Wales, Australia. Working at the intersections of socially engaged art and long-form documentary practice, Rafaela has spent over 15 years co-creating photo-based projects alongside her friends, family members, and extended kin. Their co-created archive has been exhibited at art exhibitions, including Photo Biennial Photo K in France, Zagreb M Museum of Contemporary Art for Oregon Vita International Photography Festival in Croatia, and the Center for Contemporary Photography in Australia. Thanks very much for joining us today, Rafaela. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just get straight into it. Um, apologies in advance. Um, I'll probably stick to reading, so I stay on time. Um, but before I begin, um, I want to acknowledge uh, the Yagara and Turbul people of Mianjin, whose lands I'm very grateful to live. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations people listening in today. Um, I'd also like to express my deepest gratitude to the co-creators, uh, supervisors, advisors um, and families who I work alongside and pay my respects to the Widjawal people of the Bundjalung Nation where I grew up and the Gomoroi people of the Gamilaroi Nation where I often work. Um, sovereignty has never been ceded, um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, my um, socially engaged art practice draws from my lived experience of being raised in Nimbin, um, an over-police low socioeconomic community in New South Wales, Australia. Um, using photography, moving image, sound recordings and the collection of ephemera, I employ an autoethnographic approach to documenting everyday life. Um, this practice has emerged over 15 years with contributions from women in my life to resist bureaucratic representations of our lived experiences. This includes my identical twin, um, my stepsister, friends and extended kin across several communities. Um, who I identify in my practice as, as personal uh, Can you hear that? That's not me. <laughs> Our collaborations have resulted in what we now consider a co-created archive. Uh, in recent years, our lives have increasingly intersected with the prison system, um, sometimes in violent and explicit ways. Therefore, my research engages in a broader dialogue around the power and authority of um, state, state archives, photography's complicity in maintaining imperial regimes and their connection to the prison industrial complex. In doing so, I examine the tensions that emerge within community engaged arts and documentary practice. More specifically, I explore the complex power dynamics um, and relational responsibilities of co-creating archives alongside my loved ones, particularly those occupying various states of unfreedom. It's through this analysis that I consider the, uh, my own com um, complicity in replicating carceral conditions within my practice. So this approach uh, leads me to question, what can an archive do? To date, our co-created archive has been used in family albums, funeral services, art exhibitions, and legal proceedings. However, archives can also criminalize, victimize, and marginalize. As political theorist Ariella Azale explains, the archive as an institution functions as an imperial regime of collection, classification, and control. 
where populations are indexed into differently governed groups, such as citizen, criminal, um, illegal immigrant. Part of an infrastructure of inequality and white supremacy, the social ordering of individuals and communities provides the perception that state sanctioned violence enacted upon specific populations is somewhat justified. However, these systems are replicated across many institutions in our society. As curator Rissa uh, Palio explains, um, the museum has historically operated through capture and the prison through collection. The museum is a repository of all that society values and the prison is a site for storing all that the same society seeks to disavow and discard. However, community-based art uh, organizations are no exception. Traditionally, community-based arts um, has served as a socially engaged art practice that aims to transform the lives of individuals and communities through the process of creating and sharing art. This model has attracted assistance from the state, non-government agencies and corporate philanthropic, I can't say that word. <laughs> In turn, new forms of government control have emerged since the arts turn to community, thereby reproducing conditions of power and authority that are inherent to the carceral state. I bring a unique perspective to this context. Um, my involvement in community arts began as a participant with an, with an arts organization when I was a teenager. Over 14 years, I moved from participant, youth mentor, emerging artist, workshop facilitator, lead artist to project manager. The organization was not only my safety net, um, but they also became my extended family. The intimacy of such support, however, led to a complex power dynamic. As a result, the ethical terms um, and the ethical concerns and pre uh, preferred terms that I raised concerning the use of my story and co-created works were often dismissed. Despite this, uh, my photography skills, co-created works, and the success story of my transformation from being a so-called at-risk, disadvantaged and vulnerable young person to becoming an internationally award-winning photographer was utilized in all aspects of the organization's um, media platforms, funding acquittals, annual reports and grant applications. Despite being one of the organization's highest qualified arts workers uh, with a bachelor's degree, first-class honors, and a diploma in community work, it still took eight years to be paid a professional art rate, artist rate. This experience highlights the ways in which participants can be exploited through the guise of, of empowerment. This often leads um, to control remaining with the um, artist or institution facilitating the project, enacting the same archival regimes embedded within the carceral state. So who benefits from collaborative artistic exchanges when the commissioning organization, artists or acquired institutions remain with, uh, re remain with uh, control over the resulting archive? As several of my loved ones became routinely criminalized and incarcerated in recent years, our intimate approach to co-creation became heavily restricted. In response, we developed creative strategies of resistance to maintain relationships of love and care and to visualize the intimate dimensions of our, live, of our lives as we navigated carceral bureaucracies and surveillance. From six minute monitored prison phone calls to handwritten letters that circulated between us, we, get, we began to collect evidence beyond the bureaucratic narratives that otherwise represent this experience. Since our exchanges often occur under various states of unfreedom, carceral regulations have restricted my ability to provide several co-creators with ongoing consultation during periods of their captivity. This makes it impossible to renegotiate informed consent. However, Nicole Fleetwood highlights that concepts of consent and negotiation are fraught terms. 
At the end of the day, I can enter and leave these punitive settings, whereas incarcerated co-creators must return to enclosed boxes as criminalised and punished subjects. Fleetwood proposes we must consider how art practices can move beyond performative displays of collaboration, where some return to cages and others to their private homes. In turn, I've uh, adopted a slow approach where sharing our stories with an audience is not our priority. Navigating the complexities of our circumstances without pressure has been far more critical than deadlines imposed by arts institutions and stakeholders. This approach has often resulted in the publication of our co-created works being pushed back, sometimes by several years. This is evident in the publication of our um, photo book, We Met a Little Early, But I Get to Love You Longer, which faced eight years of necessary intervals. Instead, we're concerned uh, with how our co-created archive can function in more practical ways, such as advocacy within legal proceedings. To date, our co-created archive has contributed to five co-creators receiving significantly reduced custodial sentences and multiple successful bail and parole applications. Following the death of Tamara in 2020, I was forced to grapple with the shifting ontology of our co-created archive. Along with arranging Tamara's life into pictures uh, for her funeral, her family asked me to contribute to the eulogy and the victim impact statement that was presented within the courts. The same institution that rendered Tamara a criminal, an unfit mother, and just a few years prior sentenced her to a cage. It will never be enough uh, to add content to a system that is built upon imperial methodology that determines who life, whose life has value, although this was our opportunity to contribute a counter narrative to those who have deemed Tamara's life worthless. For us, Tamara was a daughter, a mother, a sister, a partner, an auntie, and a friend. Taking uh, a closer look at how arts institutions administer contracts has prompted me to examine how artists can disrupt existing hierarchies of power and control. The copyright of a photograph often remains with the photographer while the organisation facilitating the project retains non-exclusive non rights to reproduce the work. Photographed individuals, however, are left with no legal rights to their representation and are rarely recognised for their contribution to the photographic exchange. Some institutions, however, rarely provide contracts. This was my experience uh, when co-creating Home Truths. Home Truths was made with assistance from the arts organisation which supported us during our adolescence and adult years. The project aimed uh, to extend our uh, long-form photo-based practice, removing image. Early on, I realised that the project aims were not being met. The organisation's agenda and expected outcomes had shifted from what we had originally negotiated. This resulted in an additional short film referred to as the secondary project. In the absence of a contract, there was no transparency. It was clear that co-creators' voices were not being heard and there was assumption that they lacked the skills to protest their, their rights. This experience has ultimately led me to question the power structures within my own practice. In developing my ethics application for my PhD research, the Human Ethics Committee rightly questioned how co-creators can withdraw consent given our intimate relationships, particularly my identical twin, Mimi. For eight years, Mimi has struggled with an addiction to methamphetamines. It was during this time that I stopped photographing my twin. The difficulty was it felt like I was looking at myself and the camera shutter was enabling her addiction. From a place of love and concern, I often refuse to photograph vulnerable moments. Sometimes I'm tired of navigating dual roles, artist and loved one. Sometimes I need to put the camera down and be present as a sister, a family member or a friend. And sometimes not every aspect of our lives is for an audience to see. 
In 2015, heavily pregnant and finally recovering from her addiction, Mimi's house was raided by the police. The charges against Mimi carried a minimum prison sentence of 10 years to life. 16 months later, just days prior to her sentencing, the charges were dropped due to a technicality in paperwork. Instead of celebrating Mimi's freedom, our family was left dealing with the relapse of her addiction, which was caused by the anxiety of such a, uh, of a looming prison sentence. That's not me. If I think back to when um, Mimi was at her most, most vulnerable, I now understand where issues around power and consent can easily emerge. Mimi needed me at that time in her life. She was reliant on me to provide character references for court and to care for her babies if she was sent to prison. Although I decided to put the camera down for my own well-being, I didn't consider Mimi's right to privacy or her ability to withdraw consent given the relations of power that may have influenced her decisions. I began this research uh, with the intentions of developing a trauma-informed framework for documentary practice. My aims were to bring together the values of culturally informed trauma-integrated care and approaches to relational ethics to develop co-created processes that resist re-traumatization and reproducing harmful narratives of victimhood. Since reviewing the development of Home Truths with several external advisors, I now recognise that re resisting re-traumatisation can also replicate carceral conditions, particularly the state's ability to shackle an individual's right to express themselves. By removing content I deem triggering or portrayed victimhood, I risked watering down stories of injustice so they were more palatable for an audience. Concerned that my intimate relationships might influence co-creators' decisions, I didn't recognise that I was replicating the state's ability to silence narratives of pain. Despite ongoing photo theory on victimisation, it was condescending to assume that we needed to be coddled with processes that resist triggering us. Our traumas are there. We live with and manage them most days. This... Uh, this observation analysed how politics of care can manifest into forms of control. Carceral conditions are sustained by white supremacy and continue to reproduce representations of passive and powerless victims. As a white, race, as a right, as a white artist, my approach to co-creation must support co-creators to decide the fate of their archival material on their own terms. As Chelsea Wad Wadigo states, including the power to re-narrate one's own experience, whether as victim or victor. This understanding has led me to rewrite institutional contracts. For example, in 2020, uh, a Swiss museum expressed interest in acquiring several co-created works. A lengthy process of negotiations was conducted in which specific conditions were established. It was during that time that Tamara was tragically killed. I was mourning the loss of my best friend, as was her family. Since Tamara's co-creations were in the process of being acquired, I informed the museum that we required time and space to grieve. Uncomfortable with the museum um, acquiring the collage, I proposed a loan agreement to ensure Tamara's family were afforded the same authority as co-creators. The stories we share are not entirely our own. They involve our friends, family members, and communities. Recognizing how others are implicated, especially our children, is essential. Slowing down has enabled us to renegotiate on our own terms. Um, as our circumstances change, loved ones pass, and our children grow, we may choose to be represented differently in the future. The difficulty of withdrawing consent once a publication has been printed and dispersed um, has made recent negotiations with a publisher more challenging. The publisher sought unlimited worldwide non-exclusive rights to reproduce Trisha's image in a book. 
The opportunity for Tricia to renegotiate her consent prior to subsequent additions were declined. And up until this point, the negotiation process had already taken several months. And for a $90 fee that was, was to be split equally with uh, Trisha, it wasn't worth our time. I contacted Trisha to explain the potential implications of the agreement. Trisha decided we proceed with the publication. Although the contract uh, contradicts the ethics of my practice, I recognise Tricia as the rightful authority of her representation. Regardless of copyright laws that assign photographers as the custodians of photographs. Rather than um, engaging in violence master's care, I've gained a deeper understanding of the importance of resisting the imperial impo impulse to hold objects in custody. My thoughts now turn to how power dynamics can complicate uh, collaborative exchanges and, and the challenges we faced with home truths. In response to several, uh, in response to the conflicts that emerged, several co-creators, family members and I, with assistance of an intellectual property lawyer, developed an intellectual property license agreement. The agreement was designed to centre the pivotal role of collaborators from each family involved in the project. We achieved this by embedding terms and conditions expressed by the families. A list of amendments was provided um, if subsequent pub uh, public presentations of the secondary project were to take place. The terms also stipulate that all interviews, written material, and proceeds from the secondary project must benefit P collaborators. To respect Indigenous cultural protocols, it is crucial uh, to communicate and negotiate openly. Despite this, Indigenous cultural and intellectual property rights are not uh, recognised under Australian intellectual property laws. To be legally enforceable, Terry uh, Janke recommends embedding protocols within the contract's design. All stakeholders must now comply with Screen Australia's Pathways and Protocols document. Prior to subsequent screenings, informed consent must be sought and approved by key collaborators, as well as elders, relevant community members and cultural advisors. Furthermore, all participants have the option uh, to withdraw consent. Although this may limit future uses of the work, the agreement provides uh, community with control, choice and autonomy over their representations. More recent negotiations with the Institute of Modern Art regarding our forthcoming exhibition have led to curators recognising the collective nature of our work. The IMA will now provide equal artist fees for co-creators and have also um, agreed to allocate 3% of the total exhibition budget towards paying the rent. Paying the Rent is a reparations initiative that recognises that sovereignty has never been ceded in this country. By making this small gesture, we acknowledge the, the exhibition's presence on stolen land, the museum's role in perpetuating colonialism and its connection to the castle state. This leads me to consider how contracts can be used to enable the relational nature of our collaborations. Rather than a static and legally binding contract, how can we formulate relational agreements that outline, that outline practical arrangements and individual terms, but also acknowledge that our circumstances change as do our relationships? How can these agreements allow for greater um, transparency, accountability and autonomy? And how can these agreements truly uh, resist carceral logic when these structures continue to be maintained within the art sector? In a world conditioned by imperial power, Azalea calls for us to strike. In her words, Imagine artists, photographers, curators, art scholars, uh, newspaper editors, museum goers or art concierge going on strike and refusing to pursue their work because the field of art sustains the imperial condition and participates in its reproduction. A collective strike is an opportunity to unlearn imperialism with and among others, even though it has been naturalised into one's 
into one's professional life. This brings me to my last thought. Imagine what an archive could do if controlled by the people it seeks to represent, oppress, criminalize, or victimize. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rafaela. That was really, really fascinating. And um, there's so much in that that I'm sure people have uh, a lot of questions in the Q and A. So thank you so much um, for for mm -hmm. your time. That was that was really, really, really interesting. Um, I'm now going to introduce our next speaker, Justin Carey. If you want to go ahead and start loading up your slides, Justin. Um, Justin Carey was the recipient of a reframed bursary in 2020 to create work about the COVID-19 pandemic, the outcome of which was exhibited at Format Photography Festival in 2021 and published into the book, The Traveling World Is Not Arriving. His project titled Reaching Out Into the Dark was shown at Studio 1.1 Gallery in London in 2018. He was, and he was featured in season one of the Photo Ethics Podcast in 2020. He's currently based in Birmingham, UK. And just before I hand it over uh, to Justin, I just wanted to um, issue a, a gentle reminder uh, to everyone to please uh, be mindful of your microphones and please keep them muted uh, for the duration of uh, this, this session today. Thank you very much. All right, Justin, it's all yours. Thank you, Savannah and Rebecca, for inviting me to be here today. Um, I'm happy to be here and really happy to be presenting alongside Sophie and Raffaella. Um, honestly, when I was first asked to be part of today's event, I wasn't sure I'd have much to bring to the topic, um, particularly because I don't consider myself an expert as such in this area. And I'm also constantly learning, reflecting about all of these issues myself in my own practice. Um, and particularly so more recently, as I find that my work increasingly involves a sort of deeper exploration of my own vulnerabilities. So today I'm simply hoping to share some reflections gained from my own photographic work, as well as from my other job where issues around vulnerability and safeguarding are a daily challenge. Hopefully one or two of these ideas will resonate for you. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning from everyone else here today about this issue. As I started to think about this topic and some sort of definition of vulnerability, I immediately thought of Brene Brown. And if you don't know of her, she's an American researcher who's spoken extensively about vulnerability and presented a TED talk on the topic of the power of vulnerability in 2011, which, which you may well have seen. As it turns out, she pops up a few more times in this talk, so apologies in advance. Brown describes vulnerability as basically uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. The Cambridge Dictionary defines vulnerability as being able to be easily physically or mentally hurt, influenced or attacked. So we know we're dealing with risky business here, right? And there's a potential for harm that we have to be mindful of. Knowing this, it's probably natural to ask, why shouldn't we just avoid all of it and steer well clear of anything that might elicit or demonstrate vulnerability at all? In response, I'd argue that it's, it's it's not reasonable to ignore vulnerability entirely. We live in an incredibly challenging world right now. The last couple of years in particular have shown us all how exposed and vulnerable we can be and how a sense of certainty or safety can be shattered almost immediately. With this being the case, rather than trying to ignore or eliminate potential vulnerability in ourselves or others, it seems more reasonable to consider how we best accommodate it in our lives and in our work. How do we reconcile ourselves with the fact that vulnerability exists and ensure that we therefore respond accordingly to reduce that potential for harm? So for the purposes of today, I'd like to propose that we think about vulnerability in three domains. Firstly, the practitioner, yourself, the person that's making the work. What are your vulnerabilities and how might they impact you and others in the process of making your work? Secondly, your subjects. If you're photographing other people, there's usually an inherent power dynamic at play and it pays to be aware of that. I think Raffaella's talk demonstrated that in much, much more detail. This potentially renders your subject vulnerable and aside from any vulnerability intrinsic to them, which indeed may be at least partially why you've chosen to photograph them in the first place. Thirdly, the audience. It's, diff it's certainly a difficult group to account for, but increasingly I believe that if you aspire to, tr to truly ethical practice, you're obliged to consider the audience in some way. 
how your work may be received by them and the impact it might have. So how do we approach our own vulnerability and how much of that can be allowed to influence the work? I'd say this will be a different answer for everyone, but it's a question I'd urge all of you to think about. Personally, my answer to this question has evolved over time. I'd argue now that it's really difficult for me to make work that's meaningful to me without addressing first my own vulnerability, at least to some degree. As Brene says, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen. And the word connection is key here for me. To make good work, I believe you have to connect first with your own vision, your motivations, your inspiration. You have to understand what it is you're trying to say and why, why, you're, why, why it's so important for you to say that. My feeling is that to establish a true connection with your audience, you're likely to have to display a degree of vulnerability. Inviting the viewer to see you or an aspect of your or someone else's existence opens the way for them to consider that they're not alone and that there's space for their particular experience too, and that we're all traveling on this journey of humanity together. So when working with people, being comfortable in your own vulnerability changes the balance of power between yourself and the subject, tilting it back towards the subject somewhat and likely fostering the conditions for a more balanced, equitable and productive interaction. I'd argue this makes for stronger and more enjoyable work. Learning to accept my own vulnerability came through the process of trying to make work about loneliness. I was focused on trying to elicit accounts from people who'd experienced isolation or loneliness and was gradually able to get people to open up to me about some of the things that they'd been through and how their experiences had affected them. As I made progress with this work, gathering images, written testimonies, music and other things, I realised that I was missing something. I had all this material, but there was a lack of coherence. I couldn't fit the pieces together in a sense that made, made the work make sense of what I was really trying to say. I'd gotten sidetracked by the responses of the participants in the project and my own reluctance to truthfully examine why I was making this work. At the time, I was living alone in London and had been living alone in various places in the world for many years. I'd rarely truly felt lonely during that period, but there was clearly a link between my own lived experience and the work I'd chosen to make at that time. I'd started out almost with this delusion that I was approaching the issue as simply a sort of interested neutral observer. And it was only when I acknowledged my close personal connection to what I was making and sought to honestly understand where the impulse was coming from and why I'd been detached from it in the first place that I was able to bring the work together. I was vulnerable, but I'd been trying to make this work without acknowledging that or depicting it in the work in any way. And this was ultimately untenable. By accepting my own stake in the issue and weaving my own experiences in with those of my collaborators, I was able to make more meaningful work and that opened the dialogue with others about their experiences of solitude and loneliness. It's been remarkable actually how people continue to encounter the work and share reflections with me about what they've been through as a result. And so I couldn't agree more with this quote um, from Raphael Haig Haigster. I, I truly do believe that accepting vulnerability is a strength. I also believe that it's very difficult to accept vulnerability in others to create space for it and to hold it with the grace or respect that's needed to be able to document it if you're unwilling to acknowledge your own. Thinking about our subjects then, it's important to be aware of the various ways that they might be vulnerable, both intrinsically and as a result of being photographed. These synonyms for the word vulnerable conjure up for me the wide range of possible ways in which our subjects may be at risk of harm in the process of us depicting them in our work. The history of photography and me visual media in general is awash with examples of practitioners who've done a less than superb job of considering and mitigating the vulnerability of their subjects and the harm that their work could cause. Um, I think Raffaella referred to the sort of imperialism of photography and I'd entirely agree with that. People such as Alice Seeley Harris in the early 1900s, for example, created images that had on the face of it essentially noble intentions, but these pictures can be considered to be highly problematic now, and at the very least serve to illustrate the difficult line between exposing important issues and the exploitation of incredibly vulnerable people. 
as well as the critical need to be aware of the power dynamic in play when you wield the camera. There's greater understanding of the harm that these practices have caused to affected people and communities now than there has been in the past. And organizations such as the Photography Ethics Center, of course, have responded to try and raise awareness and change practice around these issues. It's worth stating that none of this is straightforward. The ethics of working with people is not a fixed or static thing, but rather should be open to change that reflects increased awareness of the factors involved and the circumstances in which you're working. Every person will have a different approach and the circumstances in which you're working at the time could significantly affect the way you're able to interact with your subjects. Clearly also, um, after you've made the work, this isn't something that you can then forget about. It still requires ongoing consideration depending on what subsequently happens with the work that you've made. So it's okay to accept that sometimes these questions are not accompanied by easy answers and that a tension may exist between the desire to tell a particular story and the needs, rights or comforts of those involved in that story. The first step though, I think, is acknowledging that this tension exists and rather than blindly pressing on without stopping to consider how the work might affect others. If we're able to confront our previous practice and ask whether old methods are still justifiable or whether in fact there's a better way to do things, we can always be developing into more thoughtful, open, collaborative and less harmful practitioners. Practicing with empathy is a starting point here for me, seeking to understand what might be going on for your subject. Of course, the first thing to do to find that out is to ask them and see what comes up. In other cases, predictable issues arise that you should be mindful of and you should hopefully be able to anticipate. Discrepancies of social standing, language, wealth or gender and many other things between the photographer and the subject all have the potential to increase the subject's feeling of vulnerability. I would urge you to think of it as your obligation to consider all of these factors for every person you photograph, as well as what you can do to reduce their vulnerability and mitigate harm. This requires a flexible approach for sure, and a willingness to accept that you may not always be the best person to make this particular work or take this particular shot or make the work in the way that you initially planned. It's also important to consider the autonomy and individuality of your subject and their ability to act within their own context, even if they may seem to be disadvantaged from your perspective. Again, the history of the visual arts is littered with examples of paternalistic depictions of supposedly disadvantaged people where their complexity and humanity is reduced to a sort of one-dimensional dehumanizing portrayals that fail to afford them the same consideration that they would have been allowed if photographed in a different context. So we must avoid removing the subject's ability to decide or at least influence how they are portrayed due to the assumption that because they're vulnerable, we can decide what's best for them. If rather we aim to collaborate, giving the subject to say in how the work is made and how they're presented as seen here, for example, in the Hands of Self-Portrait project, we can put people at ease and create better interactions. Again, it requires flexibility to accept that the more autonomy you give to the subject and the further from your own vision for the work you may end up, ceding some of this control will likely result in different work to what you envisaged, but quite possibly better work. Another issue arising here is about the way our work is shared and distributed. Often people aren't fully aware of what this will entail. And a number of practitioners have spoken about problems that arose once someone saw their picture in an exhibition or publication and demanded its removal and the difficulties this can cause. Thinking back to our synonyms, people can feel unguarded, defenseless and unprotected when they encounter work that may have been made in a safe space for them that is now displayed in a public or online setting. And this can be very unsettling. It's important to be as honest as possible, I think, about where you're likely to share the images that you make and what potential outcomes might arise from this prior to making the work. This demonstrates care for your subject and anticipates a potential future area of vulnerability for them. My own experience of these issues came in the case of the work that I made with my mum in 2020, which um, was produced in the book that was mentioned by Savannah. I was trying to secure a bursary to make work about the experience of the pandemic and wanted to contrast my mum's experience sheltering alone at home during the first lockdown with my experience working on the front line in a hospital. 
I discussed my ideas with her and she agreed to be part of it. As part of the application process, I submitted some preliminary images to illustrate how I'd go about creating the work for the project, one of which was a portrait of my mum in her home. I was happy to be selected, but in the meantime, the images I'd submitted in the application were used by the organisers in their promotional work. This was unanticipated, and my mum was actually really uncomfortable when she saw this image of herself at home, presented in an online seminar. She was still willing to take part, but it was clear that she was not going to be comfortable with being put on public display in certain ways. There was no way around the fact that the plan that I've drawn up to approach making this work would now have to change. And at the time, it was unfortunate because time was against me, the deadline was approaching, and there were various practical challenges during that time with the sort of shielding, social distancing, etc. But we had to devise a different way to go about things. So after discussion with her, we eventually decided that her face would not be visible in any of the final images. So I had to work around this, but it was an absolute requirement to be able to make the work at all and to ensure that she would be comfortable. When the work was finally published, Mum did not feel exposed and was proud of her involvement in the project, which was ultimately most important. One of the reasons I work in the way that I do is because I prefer to include people more in the production of the work. This usually requires me to know them to some degree, at least to the point where I've already established a degree of comfort or connection with them and they feel able to influence what's going on. I prefer to work in that space of dialogue where I'm explaining what I'm trying to do and hopefully taking the person along with me. My feeling is that this allows me to work, make, make work that's more meaningful to me and in a way that is more satisfying overall. I accept that to have the time to create that comfort is something of a luxury and one that many other photographers don't have. I've got massive respect for photographers who don't work in this way, but who are still able to navigate these ethical considerations of working with people, but in a much more time constrained environment. Finally, I just want to touch on consideration of your audience. Clearly, it's not always possible to control how your work is displayed, and you can never have a complete picture of who ultimately interacts with it. However, where you can influence this, it's worth considering how we account for possible harm to our viewers. And I think also, as um, discussed by Rafaela previously, how also you can manage the harm to your collaborators in the display of your work too. Clearly, if the work you make deals with obviously sensitive topics, it's worth considering how your viewer may encounter it and whether a reaction arising from this encounter is within, is within your responsibility as a practitioner. For example, both the environment in which the work is shown and the context in which it is presented may affect the work and how it's received and the reaction that it will elicit. A unifying principle to restate here is that acknowledging vulnerability, making room for it and seeking to prevent harm arising from it are positive aspects of your practice. If you're able to make space for it in our subjects and our audience and co-create safe spaces where stories can be told despite or through this feeling of being exposed or unguarded, we actually help to increase the range of stories that can be told and allow more voices to be heard and more perspectives to be seen and shared. And this benefits all of us. So to close then, I'd like to reiterate the general principles that I feel are important when documenting and exhibiting vulnerability. Firstly, don't be afraid to examine yourself and be prepared to acknowledge your own vulnerability. From here, seek to understand how this relates to the work that you're making and the people that you're making it with. Be honest with your subjects about what you're trying to achieve and where the work might go. Be empathetic, be mindful of the dynamic between the photographer and the subject and try to put yourself in your subject's shoes and consider how the creation of this work might affect them. Be flexible, understand that despite your best intentions, things might come up that require you to change your approach or possibly even completely abandon your initial intentions for the work. Finally, accept that this is a lifelong process of reflection, learning, and hopefully steady improvement along the way. I hope you can find some way to allow vulnerability into your work. And thank you for listening to me today.
That's great, Justin. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that and for sharing so much of your personal experience with your mother as well. I think, you know, the topic of family, you know, as well as Rafaela discussed, will be an, a great one to talk about later in uh, the roundtable discussion. So maybe we can pick up on some of those themes later. So thank you very much uh, for, for sharing that. Um, our next speaker and our last speaker is going to be Sophie Harris Taylor. So, Sophie, if you want to go ahead and get your slides up, I will introduce you. So Sophie Harris Taylor documents the personal lives and experiences of herself and others. Loosely based in portraiture, her practice is often a combination of images and text, opening conversations and telling people's stories, which may otherwise go un unspoken. The themes are driven by her own preoccupations and vulnerabilities as a way for her to process and digest through the lives of others. Sophie has had three books published, both sisters, and MTWTFSS, Chapter One. Sophie has been selected for the Taylor Wessing Prize, Creative Review Photography Annual, the BJP Portrait of Britain, and others. Sophie was born in London, where she still lives. So I'll hand it over to you. Hello. Um, thank you for having me. And thank you um, both for your really inspiring talks about your practice. Um, I'm going to just share with you um, a few projects that I've been working on and I guess talk a little bit about the vulnerability surrounding those projects. Most of my practice comes out of my own kind of interests, my own life experiences and I tend to, and my own vulnerabilities, and I tend to use others to explore these themes. Often they're quite common themes that go kind of like a little bit unnoticed or unspoken um, so I, I try and kind of collaborate with other people going through these experiences and um, kind of through images and text, I've started um, interviewing more all of my subjects these days just to try and give their voice, put their voice across. So I am the photographer, so in some ways I have that power in, in the sense that I'm choosing how to photograph, where to sit them and all of that kind of stuff. But I try and kind of always include their voice and their story and also make them as comfortable as possible. So I'm just going to crack on with one of the first projects um, I'm going to talk to you about is milk. And this came about after the birth of my son. And um, I started breastfeeding and having lots of challenges and complications. And I felt that we weren't really there wasn't really anything out there that kind of explored breastfeeding. Um, in I guess in a more intimate and more of a kind of conversational way even in like the antenatal classes we were kind of given a knitted boob to look at but not really shown how or where or all the kind of goings on about it and as a new mum you're quite um it's I guess it's like a bit of a 24 7 job so I set out at the time I had a very little one and I wanted to go and meet other mums that were breastfeeding and going through these experiences and I wanted to chat to them capture them in their own homes in their own environments and kind of kind of share their stories so I'm going to flick through some of the images um I guess I'm going to share some of the text as well afterwards but I'm going to keep talking uh, I've got my notes here so I'm not missing anything um a lot of the challenges around casting is always that I have to be really open and honest with my subjects and it was very clear from the get-go that I didn't want to capture these kind of nursing Madonna-like images of mum sitting reclining in chairs. I wanted to capture kind of um, expressing, pumping, babies crying, wriggling. Um, so it was, I needed to get people involved that were willing to be open and honest about their experiences, but also be in front of the camera. And having had work published before, online and in exhibitions and in books I'm always really honest with the the subjects that this will make this may lead to this that and the other I was making sure I get kind of model and minor release forms for this um and a lot of the time I'll I'll only really work with people that are like super super comfortable often I'll have a lot of conversations with people and I think if they're kind of upping and erring and things then I won't I'll choose not to photograph them because I just think it's it's not going to go in anyone's favour. Um, 
so these are some of the images from that. I'm just trying to think what else uh, I want to say more. Um, I shoot with natural light and this kind of often helps because a lot of the shoots, especially these ones with kind of babies, are um, you have to work quite quickly, maybe not so much in the shop, but um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think what else I'm saying about this. I stylize the shoots to an extent. Um, they're not always sitting there with their tops off, but to kind of capture the realities of the breastfeeding, it's a bit clearer for them to be having their tops off. I'm going to read you a couple of quotes now from, I'll start with this one from Thea, just so you can kind of gain like an understanding of how the images sit alongside the text. So she said here, Nova had a tongue tie for the first eight weeks, which made breastfeeding very tedious for me. He'd feed for very long periods and never seemed satisfied afterwards. I was constantly questioning my ability and supply, as well as dealing with sore nipples, exhaustion and all over discomfort. I built a negative relationship with the whole thing that is hard to break, even though things are better off with tongue tie surgery. And I've got another quote from Lizzie, which is a pumping one. Um, she says, you can go to every lactation class, read every book of super long teeth shaped nipples, and it can still be bloody difficult. The feeling of failure that I couldn't get breastfeeding to work and having to exclusively pump for almost three months. I made myself sick with bladder infections and mastitis and nipple thrush. I really imagine myself as some earth mother that would breastfeed her baby until six months and beyond, and I'll always feel guilty. I wasn't able to do that. And then I'll end on a slightly more positive quote from Shanine. I'm abundant, free flowing, all nourishing. And even when I don't feel like magic, I am. And breastfeeding has shown me that. So this project, it wasn't really trying to be for or against in any way. Um, and there, there's lots of people out there that can't breastfeed for whatever reason or don't want to. And I just wanted to explore the subject and wanted to collaborate and work with other mums that felt comfortable to talk about their experiences. The work was shown um, during, I think I made um, a small publication during one of the lockdowns or the start of the lockdown. And the um, I self-published a book and we did a few print runs and they sold out very quickly and it went all over the world. And I think people really resonated with the subject and the fact that people began to talk and share more openly about it. And that's kind of what my work's about, really. It's telling people stories and trying to get subjects out there. Um, I am using people and photographing people in quite, in some ways, in quite a vulnerable way. But I'll always be as kind of honest and um, collaborative as I can possibly be um, when I'm working with them. I had some experience very early on when I was, uh, when I first started kind of photographing and then putting work out, sharing work, I was mainly photographing my friends in quite intimate and personal settings. And they were completely comfortable with being photographed like that. But when the work came to be out exhibited or put online, it was a different story. So I think I learned quite quickly, very early on that you need to, you know, um, capturing someone is one thing, but then putting it out there is completely different. And you need to kind of almost be quite mindful of that when you're making any work. Um, so I have quite an open policy with friends that I capture now that anything I take, I share with them first, and then they'll either allow me or not allow me to use it. And with people that I don't know, which is majority of people in the projects that I work with, we it's a real conversation, but most of the images, they, they don't necessarily approve any afterwards but I'll always share them with them and obviously if there's any particular ones that they don't want me to use I'm very comfortable and like we can have that conversation. Um, I'm going to move on to an ongoing project um, that explores um, people in recovery from eating disorders and I've started it um, years ago and I am still trying to continue it but it's quite a slow one so I have to be really mindful that a lot of the people um, 
that I'm working with here are in, um, we're talking about their mental health, they're very vulnerable. I have my own experience um, of being in recovery for uh, 10 to 20 years. So I have an understanding of the subject, which I think enables the people that I am working with to kind of allow me in and to have a conversation and to share their story with me. The reason why I made started making the work was because I felt we, a, a couple of things, like we often in the media and um, th think of an eating disorder and have an image in our heads, um, which is not true, but we also often only hear about people on the brink of death or people that have completely recovered. And in actual fact, the majority of people with eating disorders sit somewhere in the middle and they're kind of at some point in their recovery. But what does that really mean? So I just wanted to explore this. So this is um, Katie, who I met, a portrait of her. And this is her, I put the quote here, but I'll read it out. And um, I think this kind of, um, I'll just start with this quote. Some days I wake up and I look in the mirror and I just wish I could claw it all off. I wish I could get a giant Dyson vacuum and just suck it out especially in the evenings, if I've managed to eat relatively well in the day, my body image is horrendous. Having a shower in the evening, I find the most disgusting, disgusting thing, and I feel like fat's everywhere, and I know it's not really related to weight. I pretend it's related to weight, and I pretend that I would feel better about my body if I were at a lower weight. But I know realistically, all I'm doing is trying to numb the inside thing by treating it externally, which doesn't make much sense. And this is a um, girl called Holly, and she talks about her pregnancy. So she says, um, carrying a baby was really painful. With Dylan, my eldest, two of my ribs cracked because my body was not equipped. Because I developed anorexia so young, my pelvis never widened properly. So I had really complex pregnancies, were very hard, very hard, and it was difficult knowing no matter what I did, I couldn't make them not high risk. The damage was done years before. But being pregnant did want me did make me want to get better because I didn't want to be unwell and I didn't want to be a bad mum and I worried what impact my eating disorder was having my children. I had this intense guilt that what I was doing wasn't enough, but it's so hard to recover whilst you're pregnant because you have zero control over what's happening to your body. It's doing the thing you're most scared of, expanding way beyond your control. And I'm going to flick through a few more. And... I'm going to, this is Emma, who I actually met in, she was in hospital. She was on a cystic fibrosis ward um, in London. And I went and visited her as an inpatient. And she talks a bit about what led her to this point um, at the time. And she says, my journey was disordered, with disordered eating began when I was 14. And there are a few triggers for that. I've got cystic fibrosis. And that was the thing that I was rebelling against and I didn't like not having any control over my body and B I was also sexually assaulted whilst I was 14 and I remember after that happening being really sick and it made me feel clean so for me it became about not being and feeling dirty but unfortunately I did have three miscarriages resulting from the IVF the, one, the last one being not this April but the April before and the first one was on my birthday that's how much my body hates me that was fairly traumatic for both me and my partner and I think once we had that last miscarriage, I kind of gave my pal myself permission to start all that behavior again. And then these are a few more, a few more images. And oh, I'll end on this quote um, from Sophie. And it says, I just got tired of the fight and recovery became natural. And so these images are, I'm, I'm working with the subjects, going to their homes, taking um, not very many portraits. Um, I've been working on film, so just like a few snaps because a lot of the people feel quite uncomfortable in themselves anyway and being in front of the camera isn't their, like it's just not their thing, but they know it's a, it's a photographic project and I want an image to kind of go with and tell their story. Um, I think the images for me are quite reflective. I don't want to do anything. Um, they're, they're quite kind of just still portraits. Um, nothing too, I don't really know what the word I'm trying to look for, but nothing too overly posed or 
kind of um they're not in a way they're not exciting images they're just quite still um but i think the text say a lot um so i'm going to continue working with this i need to consider a lot more about a lot of diversity and casting again is just really really challenging um because i think that people have to be completely comfortable with um kind of talking about their mental health and mental illness and being on camera and being open about that so that's a really um kind of maybe maybe one of my slightly kind of harder subjects that i've been working on and i'm going to finish on um talking about a project that i did in 2017 and no 2018 and it's called the last months and this was um about my grandma my grandma rosie who was 105 and sorry that's my loud dog coming down the stairs anyone can hear that thumping um so i made this work during the last month of my grandmother's life she was 105 and of course i said when she reached 100 i wanted to make a project about her she she was a character full of life, Jewish, said what she thought without any filter and offended everyone and embarrassed my mother to death. I never did make this project and I never saw her as much as I should. So towards the end, I began to visit her more regularly and the conversations were really repetitive. She'd repeat the same questions within a few seconds, but she still had a glimmer of her character left. Asking me to clean her glasses every five seconds and paint her nails, her nails whilst digging some ball sweets out of her handbag. I began to bring my camera. She always thought it was funny. Why would I want to take a picture of her, let alone her bed sheets? Then she joked and said, where's my modeling fee? She found humor in the fact that it was what I did for a living. She almost didn't believe it, but she loved looking at photos and looking at true family pictures. I always showed her what I was capturing and she always just kind of just laughed and smirked. I did tell her I was making the project um, and I don't think she would have minded either way. She was always telling me what a good looking family we were. The project is only one month in her 105 years of life. She's a fraction of her size and a fraction of her character, but it's my way of holding on to the memory I have of her, a time we shared together. My regret will always be not visiting her more. I knew the last couple of pictures on the slide, which I'm about to show you here, where are they? these ones. Um, I knew these pictures would be the last ones I'd take of her. The nurses had implied she was on her way out and she was slower, frailer and more tired that day. She died peacefully in her sleep. The work came out, about pure, came out of pure emotion, a way for me to process losing her. We weren't that close, but she was, a, she was such a strong character that she was a big part of my upbringing. So I never really considered, considered the kind of ethics around sharing these images um only really now when I was asked to do this talk um but she didn't sign a release form or anything like that my mum seen the project um I showed her some images that I took at the time I know that she would have just found it quite funny and quite amusing um and yeah, I don't, I, yeah, I don't really have, I, I'd like to be asked about the ethics behind this and I don't really know what to say and whether I should be sharing these images and should be sharing her looking like this. But in, in my heart, I know that she wouldn't have minded, but I don't know who's to say, maybe she would, I'm not sure. So yeah, I'm gonna end on that one and can take any questions later. And that's it, that's kind of, that's all I've got, really. I don't know if I've run over or been too short. No, you've been absolutely spot on time. That's been perfect. Thank you so much for that, Sophie. And I really appreciate as well, um, in particular, the vulnerability, you know, yourself that you're you're demonstrating in, you know, talking about this project with your grandmother and, you know, the difficult ethical questions, you know, that are very hard to, um, yeah, to, to answer, especially after somebody passes. So thank you very much for, for your vulnerability there. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, I'm sure we're all uh, very inspired uh, and please everybody um, feel free to put in your questions into the chat. 
um, or the, I don't know if there's a Q and A function might be a Q and A function, just stick them into the chat if that is best. Um, I'd also just like to echo Rebecca in apologizing for the behavior of one of the participants, but they've been ejected. So that is taken care of. Um, I uh, am sure that everybody else remaining here will be very respectful for the remainder of the session. So thank you very much for your cooperation in advance. So if everybody, if anybody would like to share questions, please get on that. And then let's just go ahead and launch into the round table discussion. I've prepared a few questions, so I'll get us sort of get us started. Um, but uh, yes, everybody, please, please feel free to, to type them out in the chat and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, I wonder maybe just starting out, um, you all have touched on this, but I was wondering if maybe you could talk just a little bit about, I think especially Justin, you gave a really strong definition of vulnerability. Um, and I wonder if maybe you want to echo that again, or if the others can maybe offer, a, you know, what is vulnerability as a word? How do you interpret that um, specifically in your practice? Um, take it away. I think I think it's something that is really complicated because I think it, it's always changing and it, it's very situation dependent, actually. I think Sophie, um, that last project that she presented there kind of illustrates that, I think, because there's lots of questions for me about that work based on my other job as a geriatrician. I think, um, yeah, I think for me, vulnerability is really... Um, I think it starts with yourself, essentially, because if you don't acknowledge that, you know, this power dynamic between you and your subject is there, and that potentially puts you in a position to cause harm, if you're not even aware of that, then I think that's a really big problem to start off with. And so my personal experience is that I have to kind of understand why I'm doing what I'm doing in the first place. And as I'm increasingly realizing that's often arising from a personal, emotional wound of my own, you know, and if I'm not kind of addressing that first, then I think I'm in a bit more, more likely to harm someone else in the process of making work, I think. And so, yeah, I think it very much depends on the situation and the project. I can't really give you a sort of fixed, you know, all encompassing definition. I think that's a great response though as well, because I feel like that's been a theme through all of your work today is that all of your work comes from somewhere very personal. Even if you're not photographing yourself, it sort of has that origin and something that's very um, meaningful to you as individuals. Does that resonate with anybody? Um, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think the word vulnerability is such a complex word. Um, I don't think it always means like I don't think it's always such a negative thing as well I think when you bring your own vulnerability um you know there's positives in that um yeah like I know for myself <clears throat> it's been hard to I guess turn the the camera inwards on myself because of my own vulnerability and my own traumas and and, you know, that helps me understand how courageous um, my friends and family are to be able to share their stories. Um, and it just gives you that understanding of like, yeah, the, the harm that can be caused and, and why it's important to tread carefully. And um, yeah, it's a complex word and there's many, many different meanings to it. And at times, you know, vulnerability has been a positive thing um other times it's you know been a hard thing to navigate so yeah so if you would, is there anything you'd like to add to that not really I've never I've used the word so much and now we're trying to unpick the word I almost can't I have nothing um to add or say I think we throw the word about a bit like I always say about my own practice it taps it does it taps into my own vulnerabilities and I use other people's and explore others vulnerability and I think by that I just mean things that perhaps we um we shield and um kind of private 
you know, pri private kind of um, things that we're going through um, or things that perhaps it doesn't always have to be negative, but often it's kind of that can make people feel uncomfortable or others feel uncomfortable as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I just like to ask um, another question that I think dovetail, dovetails on this. And it sort of relates to something that Justin said earlier about, um, you know, knowing which stories to tell. And I, I guess I was I was wondering if you could maybe each of you talk a little bit about, you know, how do you decide what which projects? Because we all have, you know, a lot of ideas about things that we might want to uh, photograph or stories we might want to tell. But how do you sort of narrow it down and, and decide which photography projects to pursue and which are appropriate for you to pursue? So for me, it's always, I'm always pursuing something that's going on in my own head, something that I'm experiencing and I want to, I guess in some ways it's kind of selfish. I want to kind of um, find other people I can relate to, learn a bit more about things that are preoccupying my own head. Um, and I kind of delve in and I don't really think, should I do this one or this one? I just kind of go with what it kind of comes quite organically in a way. Um, I think some just due to the nature of subjects being quite sensitive or casting being really tricky, I'll kind of put off or I'll kind of um, have to think a lot more about ways around around that. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to jump in there? Um, yeah, I guess for me, obviously, I've been working with the same women in my life for 10 to 15 years. So um, I like when I first started um, the project, I was looking at young motherhood because um, my twin sister had a baby as a teenager and my stepsister had five babies by 24. And I, I guess it was a path that I was expected to take. I, I had three babies myself. Um, but yeah, like I didn't choose to be documenting what I am documenting today, I guess um, the unfolding nature of our circumstances is what led us to where we are. I, I didn't imagine um, that my loved ones would be incarcerated. Like growing up, it was usually our boyfriends that were incarcerated, not women. So I didn't see this as something I would be exploring, but the more like the longer the project like grew, I realized I wasn't documenting young motherhood. I was documenting more structural issues and um, yeah, it just grew from there. But um, in terms of what I choose, um, my work is quite personal. Um, obviously I've worked within community engaged arts and I came through as a participant. So I was working with um, communities that had participants that were also participants with myself. Um, but now um, I tend to refuse to like decline photographing in communities that I'm not connected to. Um, uh, I usually suggest other photographers um, that are more like appropriate, like have connections to that community or um, yeah. I, it's not my place and I guess as practitioners photographers what, however we identify ourselves um, we should always be questioning our positionality um, and whether you know are we equipped like do we do we have you know what kind of power dynamics are we bringing to this um, you know what is what how could we cause harm and just because you know your positionality might align with the with the issue that you're photographing doesn't mean that you're the right person um yeah it's a complex one and it it, it requires a lot of thought um i you know i'm not working as a photographer as a um as an income you know so it's not i'm not you know jumping at every every job I don't take on commissions um 
So I had that kind of choice. But um, yeah, I think it's our responsibility to really, um, I think point these industry like editors and that, um, you know, it's our, we have the power to be like, hey, I'm not the right person to be photographing this story. Have you considered this photographer? Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Is, does anybody uh, want to add anything to that before we go on to another question? You covered a lot. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's perfect. No, that's great. No, that's a good thing. No, not at all. Not at all. No, you, you, you brought up a lot of really important points. Is there anything to add there? Are we, are we happy to move on? Uh, I think I, I pretty much feel the same way as Raphael about this, actually. I think, I think it's really, I, I, but again, I just want to be clear. I can only speak for myself and I can only speak for the way I want to work. And I don't think there is uh, value in me sort of striking down other people's practice of the way they do things. Um, and also, I, I don't make money from photography in that sense. It's not my primary income. So that gives me the flexibility to be really judicious about what I'm doing. Um, and I actually think the work that I do now is more personal, partly because I feel increasingly that to make work with other people is so problematic anyway that I'd, I'd rather avoid it most of the time. And, I, and actually, um, because I kind of think the sort of gold standard of working with people is to essentially let them present themselves and that you should really have as little kind of input in that as possible. And obviously that's kind of at odds with, you know, contemporary photographic practice in the main. And so it's difficult, I think, to to make work of other people without there just being so many different sorts of problems, I think. And so, yeah, I tend to stick to topics that basically involve me and revolve around me largely. Do you have anything to add to that, Sophie? Because I I have sort of a related question that sort of comes to your work. If I maybe I'll throw that in there now. No, it's all right. It's all right. Yeah. Um, because uh, Jesse was asking, how do you find the casting process for intimate pro- projects and how do you develop an ethical approach to, to do this process? Um, it, casting takes me a really long time. It's the hard, it's kind of the hardest thing. And I use, I actually use like my social media platforms to try and engage with people and talk to people. And sometimes you're talking to people for quite quite some time messaging back and forth and then sometimes it's very instantaneous and it's like yeah I want to do this um you with like the eating disorders project to try to get the charities involved but the issue is that they'd only really give me people that were completely recovered and I wasn't really interested in talking to people that were completely recovered um because I feel like we've we hear a lot about those stories um so I had to do my own digging and things like that. I think a lot of people are using um, their own, um, now we have social media, a lot of people use their own platforms to share their own diaries and stories. And I did a project, a big project around um, common skin conditions such as acne. So that one was a lot of the people I photographed for that. People were already sharing their own stories about their acne experiences and I kind of would search like the the one of the most common drugs that people would go on for acne and I kind of searched the hashtags and had to delve in and um it's um I think it's slightly easier now I've got quite a lot of projects that I can then share with people and they can see publications and where the projects have ended up different magazines or um books and libraries and stuff but I think at the beginning when I was starting out it was really difficult because it's like well who we who who are you um like when I was fresh out of UD it's kind of like you like I didn't have much of a portfolio I only had really photographed friends so it was quite hard to kind of get people to trust you and let you in but I started slowly building up my portfolio and working with people I didn't didn't know and I think once you've got something to share and something that you're working on, um, more people are kind of inclined to come forward or go, yeah, I want to be a part of that. And they can see it. 
Um, with regard, like Justin, you were talking about, I was talking a bit about um, me also working commercially as a photographer. So separately from the projects I do, I do work in advertising and get commissioned to um, uh, do those kind of projects, which is great because it can pay my bills, but it doesn't satisfy me, um, I guess, my drive or my passion, my um, enough, um, which is why I create the personal projects. I do often get contacted to license images from my personal projects for articles and features. And, and that's when it becomes really tricky because that's when people are handing over money. So I'll always, if I am going to do any licensing, I'll always make sure that there's a model release, like a fee for a model. But a lot of my projects, um, a lot of the time I won't be able to license a work because the, the the most common one that people want to license is um is the one around acne which I didn't share today portraits of people with um predominantly acne and a lot of people that want to use these uh people are talking about um how to clear up your skin and that was what what that's not why I made the work I made the work about talking about skin positivity and wanting people to kind of um so I have to decline all of that um ethically it's just it's not it doesn't sit right with me um so and if I am going to publish the work which isn't to, isn't a feature about my work and it's to do with something completely different then I'll always allow or get the subject involved to see if they're happy with that and always try and find a fee so I think I don't know I can't remember the question that you asked but no, that's great. That, that, that's a, that's a great response. Thank you so much. And we, so we have a lot of questions coming in, which is fantastic. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, but we've got four questions here that all sort of have to do with consent in different ways. So, um, Hillary was asking about, uh, because she's working on a long-term project, uh, on dementia. So, you know, thinking about informed consent with people who have dementia or Alzheimer's, um, similarly, Francisco's asking, you know, about neurodegenerative, um, diseases, uh, you know, and asking for consent, um, from people who might have a dementia or Alzheimer's or from children. And Danny is also asking about, you know, documenting people maybe with mental health conditions. Um, Danny's working on a project with someone with paranoid schizophrenia. Um, so, you know, thinking about how, how, you know, to navigate consent with that. And finally, Alice was asking about um, consent in regards to the eating disorder project. Um, and, you know, how, how did you go about that process as well? So um, lots of, uh, questions all sort of on that that theme of consent and I think it'd be really interesting yeah to hear hear from all of you on that and as well uh Justin if, if you want to bring in some of your uh, experience working in geriatrics I think that's obviously really relevant here as well um so yeah who, who wants to who wants to start happy to start <laughs> go for it uh, yeah consent it's a trick tricky one um I think well, this is my approach. Consent should always be ongoing. You know, just because somebody provides consent first doesn't mean, you know, their, their perception, you know, their use of the image or whatever is the same. Like um, our circumstances change. We may want to be represented differently or even just like the context, you know, of the image, maybe they don't feel comfortable of where it's being shown. Um, so my approach is that to continuously, um, you know, ask consent, you know, wherever it's going. Um, in regards to, um, I guess, like, you know, mental health and um, the areas that you are talking about, um, I think like one way to mitigate it is um, having somebody else, you know, is it another family member or um, their support worker, somebody that they can have the conversation with and um, who can be like a middle person where they can, um, I guess, express their concerns with them because people aren't always going to be so open with you around um 
if they want to withdraw consent like it's a hard thing you know if you put on the spot and you're like hey can you give me consent like saying no is hard um so like for example with my uh research um the ethics process um because of my intimate relationships um i employed a indirect recruitment so somebody else contacted co-creators and asked if they would like to participate in the research because I knew if I asked them they would have said yes so um but you know like um people say yes for multiple reasons um and I think it's just um yeah you need to understand what kind of um influence your relationship and hasn't has in that um, situation um, and and try and mitigate it in some way and have you know points within the project whether it's development stages and um, prior to um, publications where people can either withdraw consent or state their terms um, and continue to um, you know re-look at it yeah, I, I love that idea of the indirect uh, recruitment, you know, because, um, you know, I think someone else has asked a question as well about, you know, uh, working with people close to you. And, you know, I, I did a I did a photo book about my grandfather's experience of dementia. And that's the thing that I found is that all family members, they want to be supportive, you know, so they're yeah. all like, oh, yeah, of course, you know, but they might be denying their own wishes in that process. So I think that's a really interesting um, approach. So thanks very much for that. Um, and yeah. And just because somebody says yes doesn't mean they mean yes, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. But the interesting thing is, is that prior, like just after they had, um, so they, the person contacted them, the first thing they did was call me and be like, hey, um, like, can I send you um, the picture of my um, signature because I don't have, uh, I can't print it off. So it was like, it didn't even work anyways because of our intimate relationship. So yeah, yeah. it's a tricky one, like, um, but I think having somebody there where they can check in and it's not you, like, I think that's important. That's great. You know, that's really helpful advice. Thanks so much. Um, Justin and Sophie, do you have anything you'd like to add about maybe particularly working with people who um, have maybe diminished capacity in some ways? So. Yeah, um, as Rafaela said, I think content is really tricky and uh, even more so if you have a cognitive impairment. Um, for those we don't know, I'm also a, a geriatrician, but that's a doctor who cares for older people. Um, and so that's what I do in my sort of day job and deal with this um, in that side of things as well. Um, I think getting consent from people with dementia is really tricky particularly for something like photographic work um and so i think there's lots of principles you can think about one if someone's really demented i probably would just not even involve them in work at all regardless of whether they're family members or advocates thought it was a good idea i personally wouldn't do that myself and wouldn't really see how that could in any way benefit the person um if someone has dementia and has impaired capacity, but not completely um, impaired, then as has been mentioned, I think it's about, firstly, depends on what you're proposing to do with them. It's about assessing how much of what you're proposing they themselves can understand and agree to. And also if they aren't able to demonstrate that they themselves can genuinely understand and agree to what they are uh, getting involved with, then it's about involving an, an independent advocate or a family member and getting them on board. If, and again, I think this is really important because all of the dynamics of, you know, if you ask someone to do something who knows you, they're predisposed to say yes most of the time. And so I think you, you just have to, you know, so like with my with working with my mum, for example, she was predisposed to help me do make that work. You know, I was making an application. She wanted me to succeed. She was kind of predisposed to, to help me. And so you, you kind of have to be aware of that and you have to be, you have to be prepared to anticipate the things that in their 
willingness to help you, they themselves won't necessarily think about because they're just kind of keen to support you. Um, and again, the, the, over the process of working with someone with dementia, their understanding of what's happening is very likely to change and very likely to fluctuate. And so you have to be aware of that and you have to have a way to ensure that at each stage where they are involved, they're doing that without any sense of coercion or with consent at each point. And I think if you have any doubt that they understand what's going on, then for me, you should just not continue if, if, if they're sort of exhibiting any sense that, you know, they don't, they've forgotten what's happened or they don't know what's happening, then I think for me, I'd sort of withdraw at that point. Um, and whether, just in terms of consent, again, I think you have to always be offering them the opportunity to withdraw because they can say yes to start with and then later on start to have misgivings and I think you have to give them the opportunity to back out without feeling any sense of you know letting you down or grudge grudging you for example yesterday I was actually contacted by the woman who was in one of the images I showed the lady who was holding the baby and she just messaged me yesterday out of the blue because she'd been seeing some of the images on social media kind of promoting today's event. And she was saying, you know, just seeing this picture kind of given her nostalgia and given her lots of feelings and memories. And I sort of said to her yesterday, I sort of said, are you still happy for me to use this picture? Because, you know, because her sort of initial message kind of suggested that she might be feeling uncomfortable about the fact that this picture was being circulated around. But she came back to me and she's like, no, no, it's totally fine, you know, all good. But I think you have to always be checking in and kind of giving people the, the chance to withdraw their consent, even if they have given it before. Yeah, I think that's a great, great point as well. Um, Sophie, would you like to chime in there about your own experience, maybe photographing your grandmother or the mm. participants with eating disorders? Well, with my grandma, actually, the my other grandma at the same, really weirdly at the same time, um, ended up um, in the same hospital she had dementia and I would also visit her and she had a stroke and she'd already had she'd already got dementia then she had a stroke and then her dementia got severely worse and she stayed in the same hospital for about a year before she passed and a year and a half and I didn't photograph her on the basis that um we didn't have that um it just wasn't the same relationship anymore and I knew um she knew who I was but I knew that she she wouldn't give me consent and I actually didn't uh, like I wouldn't have felt comfortable photographing her either um I did however make a project about losing her but I actually made a project in her home um because her home was the one that every, all the family used to gather round into was then suddenly empty um quite quickly and I found it really weird that you'd go we went round there partly because the family were then going to go on to sell her home to try and pay for her care in hospital but like went round there and like her cardigan and things were still left very much like untouched as if you just and even my grandfather who passed away quite a few years before he, all his stuff was still there so I did make a project just photographing kind of the interiors um and the, almost the absence of her um, for me, that was really therapeutic and um, in the same way that it, like photographing my other grandma was, but I, yeah, I wouldn't have felt comfortable photographing Ruby, her name was. Um, and with the um, eating disorder project, how do I get consent um, or thinking about consent? I guess it's a really long like conversation that we have prior to um us meeting and me working on the project with them but also there um none of them have been minors um is the other thing so I'm not kind of um I've not been working with people where I've been then taught having to talk to their parents and apart from the um lady who was actually in hospital for her cystic fibrosis at the time none of them have been an inpatient 
So they've all been dealing with their recovery outside of hospital, um, whether they're in treatment or not. Um, so it's kind of, I guess I've I've just been, I don't I don't really know. It's the first time I've really been asked about it. I've not really shared much of the work before. Um, they, uh, in my understanding, they have an idea of the project and where the project might be going and when the project's kind of finally I guess published in some form um, prior to that I would always get back in touch to check in to see how they're doing and we often check in anyway especially if the project's ever going to be published out there somewhere in a magazine um, because it's gone on for some time to see if the people are still you know comfortable um, that's yeah that's really all I can say on that no that's super relevant to to the next question as well and I and I really appreciate what you're saying as well about you know um there aren't that many opportunities where people ask questions about you know things like informed consent and stuff and so I'm, I'm glad if that's you know also uh something unique that people are getting from a symposia like this I, I I think that's a great finding as well, you know, so I really appreciate you sharing that as well. Um, we have a couple of questions about exhibiting and sharing work. So from Phoebe, um, Phoebe's asked, how do we go about exhibiting photographs in the right place? As a photographer, we want to share our work and have people see it and maybe even gain payment from it. Is there a right or wrong place to exhibit work? Should showing vulnerable matter align with that gallery or publication's focus? And then similarly, Antonia has asked, do you and or would you ever sell additioned prints of the work? Um, how do you navigate that? So those are sort of a couple questions about, you know, maybe the question of payment as well. And how, how do we navigate that? Does anybody want to take that? I just wanted to add um, in regard to the con consent because I it totally just I forgot. Um, not everyone can provide informed consent. Like these issues that we're talking about, like um, you know, somebody that has dementia, they can't provide informed consent. Same with children, they can't. Um, people that are incarcerated can't provide informed consent. Like they literally have no rights. Um, they can't access the budget you know, the, the agreement, um, for example, you know, somebody who is under the influence of drugs, they can't, they can't provide consent, which is why there's always like, uh, which for example, why um, we met a little early, but I get to love you longer took eight years to be published because it had to be paused. Like there was necessary intervals. I couldn't, ask for consent during those times. Um, but yeah, what was the other question? It was around um, exhibiting. Um, yes, about selling edition prints and, um, you know, knowing where to exhibit is the right place or the appropriate context for exhibiting. Yeah, like um, our work, it really depends. Um, where if I align with the institution and, and um, if I think it's a culturally safe place to show the work, it really, and that really dictates what is being shown. Um, our co-created archive is used in, it functions in different ways in different contexts. Um, you know, it's been in family albums, funeral yeah. services, um, legal proceedings um, and the stories that are shown in, in those contexts are different to what would be in an art exhibition. Um, so yeah, um, I think just really being mindful of how, um, how that space that you're showing the work will impact, um, will impact how it implicates other people, the people in the work, audiences and what is the purpose of showing it in that context. Um, in regards to um, selling edition prints, um, we currently don't um, sell our work. Um, it's a complex thing to, I guess, navigating money adds another layer of, of coercion. 
Um, of course, someone's going to say yes, like if you're going to get money. So, um, you know, that adds another layer of complexity. Um, it also doesn't feel right. I don't know, because they're such personal stories. Um, but it's not something that's, you know, out of the question. If um, co-creators want to sell their works, then we go down that path. Um, but at the moment, it's something that I, I, I avoid. Um, I'm constantly asked, you know, people want to uh, buy prints and um, I just avoid it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. No, it's super helpful. Thank you very much. Um, Justin or Sophie, do you want to jump in there? Um, in terms of it, exhibiting I think again it's just about the context where the images are going and what's surrounding that who's putting on the exhibition um I I try um with exhibiting again it's like for something like milk which was the breastfeeding series I've been looking um with other um been contacted by quite a few midwives to actually have the work seen in um, the maternity wards at some of the hospitals in and around London. Um, so I think it's like there's a right place for some some images. Um, so I think it's quite important to think a bit like if your work's going in a magazine, like what's the nature of the magazine, who's the audience, um, etc. I do sell edition prints of my work not of the series on in recovery, um, not of my own grandma, but I have sold some from Milk and I've um, spoken to people in the work if they're happy with that. Um, the, um, the subjects and they'll either be, I can't remember what we did, but there's either kind of like they'll get a, a payment or usually a print themselves, like a nice proper print themselves that they'd want. Perhaps not one of the ones where like um, the milk splurting out, but maybe slightly more of a one that I didn't include in the final series. So we often, I'll talk, I'll talk to them quite openly. If there's ever going to be money involved with subjects that have been in any of my projects, I'll always talk about that quite openly with them. Yeah, that's that's a great response. Thank you very much. Um, and Justin, do you have anything to add to that there? No, not really. No. OK, that's grand. Um, so I think we've got time really just maybe for two, but at least for one more question. So um, I'd like to ask this question from Matt, because I think it relates um, maybe to something that we're doing later uh, today as the project uh, ethics reviews. And um, so Matt was asking uh, in your own work, do you share your work with others to check and ver verify your approach? Who do you reach out to? And at what points in the process do you reach out for help and support? Do I go first? <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I share my work with um, so my supervisor on my PhD, Kelly Hussey Smith, has she was my supervisor when I did my honors. So she's been, you know, part of the work for I would say like 10 years. Um, so um she's you know in she's invaluable in like her insight because she understands the story she's met um some of the co-creators um so I feel she's definitely somebody that I go to when I'm um you know conflicted or um you know unsure because she's not somebody that um steers away from those hard questions she like gives them to me straight um so I find that really you know valuable I don't want somebody that's like patting me on the back and saying you're doing great um but um I also when I started the PhD um I couldn't get all the uh I couldn't get specific supervisors um because they weren't they weren't employed by the um 
by the university that I was at. So I created um, my own external advisory group. Um, so I have advisors who um, have experience in culturally informed trauma integrated um, practice. Um, Debbie Kilroy from Sisters Inside, which is the prison advocacy organization. And so I share my work with them and not always like, I guess it's like questions where I don't feel like I'm knowledgeable about certain things, but I'm very selective with who I show work to because you're always gonna get somebody, somebody's always gonna have a different opinion. Um, but I, I make sure I share, share the work with people whose input I value and um, that I know will be straight out with me. So, and obviously I share with um, co-creators and family members, um, especially if I'm unsure about um, something that, you know, I'm trying to protect and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm becoming controlling about something. Um, so yeah, it's a tricky one, but definitely share work. Um, but I think creating, um, I don't know. I don't know what the word is. A group, I, I wouldn't advise to share your work with everybody because it's it just becomes too complex and um, yeah. Too many cooks in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, everyone's gonna, everyone gonna have a different opinion and um, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I, I think I really like that idea of, of sort of an, uh, pulling together, um, a team that you, you trust. I think that's, that's great. Um, what about, what about you, Sophie? What do you, what do you do to, um, um I wish I could share my work you, more if I was, when I was studying, I was obviously able to share it with tutors that I had. And nowadays I actually just share it. I work quite solitary and then I share things that I'm working on with my partner um he's not he's a creative but not in this field and I'll share it with some close friends that again not they're not um working in the same field but they're all kind of um creative in their own right and it's mainly just to kind of bounce some especially initially at the beginning of the project or if I'm unsure I often want I want critical feedback um and then in terms of um working on a kind of final edit of a, of a project is very tricky and I think it's really really difficult to sit and do on your own so I'll try and get people involved in that um but yeah I think I'll I'll look for sort of um I think often I don't really I don't really plan much so I work quite organically so often I'm just sort of working away and then I then take time to kind of look at what I'm doing and often I'll just be like ugh what have I wasted my time on and actually for people to come in and they go well hold on if you put this together and actually think about what you've been doing and so sometimes just you need a bit of um help I need a bit of help to kind of make sense of what I've been doing um so I will use yeah close friends and my partner for that no that's great that's uh that's definitely helpful and um Justin what about you well, Similarly, who do you go to for support? Um, I think it's changed over time. When I was at uni, obviously, likewise, you'd be presenting your work with to your supervisor, and that's where I was making the loneliness project there. So I had that support then. I think since then, there's a photographer who is something of a mentor to me, who has also become quite a good friend, and that's someone that I would share work in progress with and kind of get their feedback and get their just kind of sense check to make sure I'm kind of going down the right route with what I'm making I think I agree with Raffaella that I think if you share your work with too many people it can become not very productive to do that um so I typically prefer to kind of have made some work already have a bit of a sense of where it's going or what I'm doing and then I'll sort of show this person and um, my partner as well and kind of get their sense of things so I typically have three people my partner this photographer and another really close friend who is an artist but not a photographer and so he brings me a sort of different perspective and those are the three people that I would typically share my work with that's great no that's uh I think that's really really great to to hear from you all because I think that that just sort of highlights 
yeah, the importance of uh, maybe not totally working in isolation all the time and, and the value that, that can come from, um, from yeah, having, having a strong network um, behind you. And uh, hopefully it also prepares us a little bit for, first of all, what we're going to be doing next, which is the open space. And then second of all, the project ethics reviews that I know um, many people here are going to be engaging in this afternoon. So um, I think we're going to have to close there. Before we close the session, I just want to really thank our panelists so much for taking the time to share your insights on vulnerability and photography. Thank you for being so willing as well to be vulnerable about your own practice and sort of the evolution of, of how you approach your work. Um, and I think it's really safe to say that we have all gained so much from listening to you today. Um, and, and you've set us up really well and really perfectly to go into this open space on vulnerability. Um, so thank you for that. I also want to thank Red Eye for enabling all of the logistics that made this session possible and for taking the reins to lead the next session. So please give uh, Red Eye a follow across social media. Please also give the Photography Ethics Center a follow um, to stay tuned for events and additional opportunities in the new year. Last but certainly not least, thank you so much to all the participants for joining us and for asking some brilliant questions. I think it's uh, fantastic to see we've still got 85 people in the room. Um, I think that's uh, just really great to, to show that um, everybody who's attended has really engaged fully, and I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate your uh, very thoughtful questions and engagement throughout the session. So I do hope that you all will stay with us and join the open space session, all of the participants, because um, that is going to, and that's going to be led by Rebecca from Red Eye. So let's take a five, four minute break now, because I talked a little too much. Um, grab a glass of water, a cup of tea, and we'll see you back here at 2 p.m. GMT.